All right, well, I've already told you what we're looking at this morning, so let me go ahead and read the text. And remember, the account of the woman who's healed from this hemorrhage is sort of sandwiched in between another account of, of Jesus going with Jairus, the synagogue ruler, to go and heal his daughter. We will read that first part, but not the concluding part, which we'll look at this evening. But we're going to focus on the woman and her faith. So, uh, Luke chapter 8, uh, beginning in verse 40, I'd like to read through vor uh, verse 48. <clears throat> this is what Luke, uh, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes. And as Jesus returned, the people welcomed him, for they had all been waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, and he was an official of the synagogue, and he fell at Jesus' feet and began to implore him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, and she was dying. But as he went, the crowds were pressing against him. And a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and could not be healed by anyone, came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. And immediately her hemorrhage stopped. And Jesus said, who is the one who touched me? And while they were all denying it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone did touch me, for I was aware that power had gone out of me. When the woman saw that she had not escaped notice, she came trembling and fell down before him and declared in the presence of all the people the reason why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. May the Lord um, bless this part of his word to our understanding uh, this morning. Now, I told you that I just want briefly to remind us of what we saw last week uh, in the evening service because I think it's very important and plus it dovetails on what we're looking at this morning. Because of the reaction of the people in the country of the Gerasenes, last week we saw that uh, Jesus basically bring his disciples to that country to give them a first-hand view of the nature of demons and demonic possession. But I think most importantly, of course, his authority over the demons. Now, this is recorded for us and for our, you know, basically for our uh, education. And why is it important then that we understand demons? Well, remember the saying, uh, a wise man knows his enemies. Uh, the demons are our enemies, right? as well as their captain, who is the devil, and the one that we have inside of us that shares the same nature as the demons, which is our flesh. Our flesh has been subdued, but it's still present with us. There is still corruption. So these are our enemies, and if we are to be ready for their attacks, we need to understand how they work. We need to understand their nature. Now, we did see a number of things through the example of the demoniac. Remember the man who was possessed by the legion and the thing that this demon or these demons were moving him to do. We saw that, that basically sin or evil or demonic influences in our flesh want to expose us to shame. And that's exactly what they did when they, they caused this man basically to strip off all of his clothing. They want to uncover us. And we see that happening today, don't we? We need to resist that temptation because it comes from the evil one. They want to drive us away from worship and fellowship. That's one of the reasons why we have a difficult time getting to church every Sunday. We need to be faithful in meeting together because as we do this, it strengthens the Lord's work within us and weakens our enemy, particularly, again, the one within. They want to make us afraid of death how they kept this man living among the tombs and death before his eyes continually. We need to keep our eyes not on death and not to be afraid of death, but rather on basically the uh, fact that God has taken the sting out of death through the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is a heaven ahead of us if we have trusted Jesus. They want to torment us as they tormented that man with guilt, the guilt over the sins we've committed in the past. We need to be convinced that Jesus has died for our sins and has taken them all away if we have trusted him. They want us to hurt ourselves as they cause the man to gash himself with stones. Well, we know that in our culture, we're, we're tempted more and more to get the adrenaline rush, right, and to do things that aren't necessarily safe 
because it feels good. But we need to make sure that we don't do anything to put our lives unnecessarily at risk. We need to not only preserve our lives, but the lives of our neighbor. And we also saw how the demons moved this man to attack the people who were walking by. Sin will cause us to want to attack other people, and particularly to get even with those that injure us in some way. But we need to resist that temptation. We need to grow in our love. We need to return good for evil. Now, as we also noted last week, Jesus has delivered us from demonic possession. They cannot uh, basically captivate us any longer as Christians. But they can still tempt us, and we need to be aware of that. Jesus has also freed us from the power of sin. We're no longer slaves of sin. We no longer have to obey sin, but we still can obey it. We can still submit to it. We shouldn't, but we can when we're tempted. So we need to be on our guard. We need to guard ourselves against what we know they're going to be doing, trying to, to tempt us to do. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the, re the way that we are filled with the Spirit, again, is through worship, by reading God's Word and listening to what it says, and by following what it says. That's what we saw last week. Now, this morning, I think we see another way to gain more spiritual strength, and that is basically through prayer. You know, we, we need to understand that these encounters that people had with Jesus, even when Peter was sinking in the water, remember, he cries out to Jesus. Those are prayers. When people come to Jesus, they're, they're essentially praying to them or, or praying to him. And that is how it corresponds to us today. Well, we see this woman come to Jesus and essentially looking to him for something, looking to him in faith. And this is the way we can gain more spiritual strength in our spiritual warfare, and that is by looking to the Lord in faith. Now, what I want us to do this morning is to look at two things. First of all, this woman's faith, because it is remarkable. And then secondly, what this teaches us about how to receive what the Lord offers us. Now, first of all, let's look at this woman's faith. Now, again, why, did, why are we, did we review what happened with the Gerasenes? Well, because we saw before how the people of the Gerasenes, when they saw Jesus do what he did, asked him to leave. And we saw why they wanted him to get out of their country. It's because they were gripped with great fear. Jesus casting out the demons, which they knew he did by that visible evidence of the herd of swine, running down the steep bank and drowning in the river, showed them, or in the lake, that God was present and they didn't want him around. Remember, the Bible says darkness hates the light, okay? They don't want to look at it because it convicts them. That's why they wanted Jesus to leave. But you know what? They needed to see that light. They needed to see Jesus, just as the people today need to see Jesus in us. That's why the Lord tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. They need to hear Jesus through us. Remember how Paul says in Romans chapter 10, how will they believe in the one whom they've not heard? Not speaking about hearing about him, but hearing him. And the way they hear him is when the gospel is shared by us. They need to see Jesus in us. They need to hear Jesus in, uh, through us if they are ever to come to him. Now, again, as we shine this light, we might be hated too. They might cast us out of their society as well. They might not want to hang out with us. But this is their only hope that we shine this light to them. So, anyway, they wanted to get rid of Jesus. But Luke tells us, on the other hand, that those who were in Capernaum actually welcomed him. Remember, that's where he had launched off from to go to the other side because he had an engagement with his disciples on the lake, and we already saw that, and then on the other side of the lake, and now he returns, and the people were waiting for his return. The Spirit was still working in their hearts, which meant that there, of course, was hope for them. Now, among these people who were waiting was Jairus, a synagogue official, and he came to Jesus and began begging him to come to his house 
and to heal his daughter because she was dying. Now, Jesus left. Jesus is gracious. Jesus is merciful. Jesus was a servant to all around him. I don't think he ever turned anyone down. He always did what was asked. The only uh, exceptions might be when his opponents were asking him to perform some kind of a miracle in order that they might somehow discredit him. But for those who were insincere, Jesus always met their needs. So Jesus left to go with him. And so did the crowds. They were all following. And they were crowding him. You know, as I thought about this picture of Jesus walking with this crowd around him, it reminded me of what it's like to go to a crowded amusement park, right? Try going to Disneyland on one of those insane days when the park is just full and you're just trying to weave in and out of people. Well, there are people that are bumping into one another all around and they are bumping into you as you make your way through the park. And that's what was happening to Jesus, probably getting jostled as he's walking along trying to, trying to get to where he's going. But as these people were crowding around him, Luke tells us a certain woman snuck up from behind. Now, we don't know the name of this woman. All we really know is why she had come. Luke tells us that she had been hemorrhaging, that she had been bleeding for 12 years. Now, not only would this sickness, of course, keep her in a constant state of weakness, which is one of the reasons why she wanted to be healed, but according to the law, it would make her perpetually unclean. Now, that would be a a great difficulty to have to live with. Listen to what Uh, Moses writes in Leviticus 15, verse 19, When a woman has a discharge, if her discharge in her body is blood, she shall continue in her menstrual impurity for seven days, and whoever touches her shall be unclean until evening. Okay? So bleeding would make one ceremonially unclean and untouchable during that period of time. And then Moses goes on to say this in verse 25, Now, if a woman has a discharge of her blood many days, not at the period of her menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond that period, all the days of her impure discharge, she shall continue as though in her menstrual impurity she is unclean. Now, that means there are consequences, right? She was unclean. Anyone who touched her during the time of this issue of blood would be unclean. Anyone who came in contact with anything she touched would be unclean. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means for one thing, uh, nobody's going to want to touch her. It's going to, you know, we need contact, right? We need contact with people. We need society. We need to know that people care about us, and this is one of the things that we come into the world needing. As a matter of fact, uh, we know that if children aren't handled as soon as they're born, uh, that there's a problem. The same thing is true of animals, and I'm not saying that people are animals, but if animals are not handled from from the time they're born, they become feral. Things are affected by not being handled. So she would not have been able to be touched for 12 years, or whoever touched her would have to then be unclean, at least until evening. But what this meant was that she wouldn't have been allowed to go into worship. She could not worship in the synagogue. She could not worship in the temple. And if she loved the Lord at all, this would have been a very difficult thing to bear. So essentially, she was a social outcast. She was almost like a leper, cut off from everyone. Remember how the lepers are to call out unclean as they go along? Uh, That, I think, is a more severe uh, disease to have than what the woman had, but the, the effect is essentially the same. Now, Luke further tells us that she had done everything that she could to be healed from this affliction. We read in in Mark... um, chapter 5, verses 25 through 26, that she had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. Essentially, all hope was gone of being delivered through the physicians. Uh, she She was hopeless, okay? But she heard about Jesus. We read, in verse 27 of Mark, okay, uh, that she had just heard of him. When she heard, she went out to, to see him, to went out to engage him because she heard not only that he had the ability to heal, but that he was willing to heal everyone who came to him and her hope revived. 
But I do think that there was a question in her mind, and I think it explains why she came to Jesus the way that she did. Would Jesus, the rabbi, the teacher, the one who's, you know, basically the prophet of God who's expounding God's truth, and we know God is with him, as Nicodemus said, because no one can do what Jesus does unless God is with him. Would he allow me to touch him, or would he touch me? Since she was unclean, the law basically forbade Jesus to do that. Now, we do know that Jesus would. Jesus, after all, reached out and touched the leper who was unclean. And how can Jesus do that and not be unclean himself, according to the law? Well, because when Jesus touches someone, he cleanses them, and they're no longer unclean. But again, she wasn't sure. And so finding him, we read in Luke 8, 44, she came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak in Mark 5, 28, for she thought, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. And as soon as she touched it, immediately her hemorrhage stopped. But, we know, what she had done did not go unnoticed. Jesus, in verse 45, said this, who is the one who touched me. Now, the crowds, we, we get their response. Uh, they were all denying it, okay? They were wondering, what's Jesus talking about, right? We're all bumping into him. Which, what do you mean, who touched you? And then Peter, as well, was confused. Master, the people are crowding and pressing in on you. You're asking, who touched you? I mean, who didn't touch you? Everyone's touching you. But what Jesus meant was more specific. Verse 46, someone did touch me. For I was aware that power had gone out of me. Isn't it interesting? Jesus didn't even know the person was going to touch him. And yet when the person touched them, the faith, as it were, caused the power to flow through Jesus and to heal this woman. Jesus knew when the Spirit did his work through him. He knew someone had been healed in this case. You know, we need to understand that Jesus is the conduit, isn't he? through which the Spirit of God flows to us. Uh, I think that was uh, one of the, the symbols of the idea of, of, you know, the anointing of the priest and the oil flowing, as it were. The priest is really a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the, the body of the priest, the body of Christ. And when the head is anointed with oil and it flows out to the parts of the body, it's a picture of the Spirit flowing through Jesus to us. Jesus is the reason why we have the Holy Spirit, why God gives the Spirit, why He heals. He is the conduit through which the Spirit does His work. And so we have to come to Jesus to receive this work, which is what she did, and the Spirit through Jesus healed her. Now, this woman was hoping that she could basically hit and run, <laughs> that she could get her miracle and sneak away without being noticed. And that's why she didn't immediately answer when Jesus turned around and said, who touched me? Because, you know, Master, what do you mean? The crowds are denying it, and Peter's saying, Lord, what do you mean by this? But Luke writes this, when the woman saw that she had not escaped notice, she came trembling and fell down before him and declared in the presence of all the people the reason why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And, of course, she was mistaken about Jesus' response, right? She was, she was sneaking up behind him because she was afraid of how he might respond. But he wasn't angry at all. He wasn't offended. Jesus, far from being angry, expressed, I think, a, a very tender affection and love for this woman. He says in verse 48, Daughter, which, again, is an endearing term, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Now, again, just, tell, just understand what this tells us about the nature of our Lord Jesus Christ and of His mercy and of His grace. This is the day of grace. Jesus isn't rebuffing and turning people away who come to Him. He receives everyone who comes, and particularly when they come in faith, He receives them, of course, as sons and daughters. This was one of His. Now, this, again, is a picture of the Lord's mercy. It is an example of His mercy, but it's also a picture to us of the kind of faith that we need in order to receive from the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want us to just look at the applicational point for a few minutes. What does this teach us about how to receive? What the Lord basically freely offers to us 
through his word, through the gospel, through his promises. Not only with regard to the power that we need to fight against our spiritual enemies, but for everything that we need, everything he promises to give us. Well, I think it teaches us, first of all, that we do need to go to Jesus, don't we? (laughs) We need to come to Jesus. Uh, James writes in James 4, verse 2, with regard to why don't we have what we need, he says, you do not have because you do not ask. We do need to ask. Now, this woman didn't receive anything until she came to Jesus. She had to come to Jesus with her needs. Now, she didn't technically ask Jesus, but what she did amounts, I think, to the same thing. She came to him wanting something, trusting that he would provide it for her, even if Jesus wasn't aware of it, although she was mistaken on that account. Jesus wants us to come. He wants us to come. Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 and 8 in the Sermon on the Mount. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. How do we know that's true? Well, Jesus said it. But this woman found it to be true, didn't she? She came to Jesus, and she was seeking, and she received. Jesus goes on to say in John 16, verse 24, to his disciples, Until now, you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, so that your joy may be made full. Now, realize there are times when we will ask the Lord for certain things, and he may say, no, because what we're asking for isn't good, isn't good for us. Have you ever asked for anything that isn't good for you? If you haven't received it, it wasn't good for you. He may say, yes, but not now. He may put it off, or he may say, yes, and give it to you. I think more often it's the second one, yes, but not now. When we ask according to God's will, we know he has heard us, and we know that we have received what it is we've asked, because we've asked according to his word in the name of the Son. Jesus says, ask. Make sure you're asking so that you will receive so that your joy may be made full. Does Jesus want you and me to have joy? He does. Even in the midst of difficulty, we can have joy because the things that we have are much greater than the things maybe we missed out on, okay? Now, we also need to go to him first, okay? Uh, Sometimes I think we do try to deal with our problems the way this woman did as she sought help from basically uh, medicine, the primitive medicine of that time, trying to do everything that we can to solve the problem ourselves, and then when we've tried everything else, then we go to the Lord in prayer. Jesus wants us to go to him first. Now, he does want us to do what we can do. He wants us to do what we are responsible to do, but he does want us to come to him first and to ask for his help first so that he might bless the things that we are seeking to do, so that we might see him as the source of those blessings. And Jesus is the source. He is the one, ultimately, uh, through whom basically all of our blessings come. He is the conduit, as we've seen. Now, secondly, we need to come to him in faith. We need to come to him, first of all, knowing that he will receive us. Remember this woman stuck up behind him in order to steal a blessing from him because she was afraid he wouldn't receive her. But Jesus not only received her, he received her warmly. And why is it that the Father gave us his Son? In order to cleanse us from all of our sins, except that we might be able to come to him. We don't need to be afraid that Jesus will turn us away. As a matter of fact, Jesus basically says... Everyone who comes to him for salvation, he will not turn away. All the Father gives to me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. And if, of course, he will give to us salvation, how much more will he not with Jesus give us all things that we need? So we need to ask. We need to ask believing he's going to receive us. And then thirdly, we need to ask in faith that we will receive what we've asked and not doubt. Boy, that's a, that's a tough one, isn't it? Doubt. Why would the Lord want to give this thing to me? I don't deserve it, right? Well, no, we don't deserve it. But Jesus does deserve it. 
And that's why we ask in his name. And that's why we can ask without doubt. Listen to what James writes. And we have to remember that James was basically known as the apostle of the law. You know, the law still has its relevance, a very important relevance in the new covenant. Um, we do need to keep the law. Jesus has given us the power to keep it. We don't keep it to be saved, but we keep it because it pleases the Lord and because it's right and because it pleases us. We want to obey the Lord. But in his exposition, sometimes it sounds like he speaks without grace. But this is what he says in chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith, without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Faith and doubt, those are basically opposite things. We need to come to the Lord believing and not doubting. Now, this woman believed. She believed that if she could just touch the edge of his robe, she would be healed. And you know what? She believed, she touched she was healed, okay? The Lord is true to his word. Now, she wasn't healed because she touched him. Remember, there were people that were pressing in all around Jesus, and they were touching him too. They didn't receive anything. She was healed because she believed. She was healed because she had faith. You don't even have to touch Jesus in order to be healed. Remember how the centurion came out on behalf of his servant, and when Jesus said, I'll come and I'll heal your servant, he says, Lord, you don't have to come. I am a man under authority. I tell my servant to do this, and he does it. And I know you have authority. You just tell the, the sickness to leave, and it'll obey you. Jesus doesn't have to be there. But what has to be there is faith. Faith, of course, that the Lord is going to do what he said he would do. She was healed because she believed. Jesus says in Luke 8, 48, Daughter, your faith has made you well. It wasn't that her faith healed her. But her faith in Jesus healed her. Her faith enabled her to receive from the one who could heal her. If we are to receive anything from the Lord, we do need to look to Him. In faith, we need to look to Him believing, okay? Believing that He's true to His word. Believing He can do it. Believing He will do it, okay? So let me just close by asking this question. What do you need this morning? right? What do you need? Do you need forgiveness? Have you not yet come to the Lord Jesus Christ to receive His mercy and grace to be cleansed of all your sins? You need to look to Jesus in faith, and He will forgive you. Do you need healing? Now, this is a little bit of a touchy subject, but again, the Lord heals, but He heals through various means, and we don't necessarily believe in the continuance of of the gifts today, that there's a person who's empowered to heal whoever he touches, but we do know that Jesus heals. That's why he tells us to pray for one another, to pray and even sometimes to be anointed with oil by the elders of the church, as James tells us as well. But we need to look to Jesus. We need to come to Jesus. We need to reach out, as it were, and touch the hem of his garment in prayer and in faith and ask him for his grace, believing. And the Lord will work in his way to do his will. But we need to believe, don't we? Do you need power to overcome your sins? We're all struggling with sin as we saw how the evil one works and how our sin works. Are you struggling in that area? Are you struggling with the courage that you need to be witnesses for the Lord Jesus in a world that is hostile towards him? Reach out to Jesus. Pray. Draw the strength you need from him by faith because he promises he will give you that strength. Remember that Jesus is the source of God's blessings. And another thing that's wonderful to think about is there's no limit to his blessings. Do you know that uh, those who have been coming to Jesus and, and they've been coming to him throughout, throughout the centuries, all the way back to the fall, I believe Adam and Eve did as well. Uh, they did it through the promises and the types and shadows. We do it by looking back at the cross or basically by looking to the Lord Jesus Christ who is in heaven. All who have come to him through the centuries, no one has ever gone away empty-handed from the beginning of creation. That's because there is no limit to the grace 
that is in our Lord Jesus Christ. And so if we come to Him, if we come to Him in faith, if we come to Him asking for our needs, we will not go away empty-handed because the Lord has promised. So let's learn the lesson from this example. You know, this woman was simply doing what the Lord tells all of us to do. We're not doing it because she did it, but we're following the example because she's doing what she should have been doing. The Lord tells us to look to Him in faith, believing, and He will grant it to us. Again, according to His will, as He knows it is good for us, taking into account all the other things, but He will hear and He will answer and we will have what we need from the Lord. Well, may the Lord encourage us again through this passage this morning. Let, let's bow in just a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to apply what we've heard uh, to each of us individually. Let's uh, spend a few moments in, in silent prayer.